So I've written a program called ChatGPTMD, and what ChatGPTMD does is that it uh, is basically just ChatGPT and Obsidian, right? Straightforward, right? So what I can do is I can highlight this text and then I can hit alt forward slash. This immediately opens up a new folder in my chat GPT or a new file in my chat GPT chats with the timestamp, which pay attention to this because it's going to change pretty soon. And it'll say I'm a helpful assistant, which we say zero, zero. Um, but actually for this thing, we want this app idea, but we don't really need to. Uh, I guess we can kind of just copy this over here. Um, let's go back to this guy and then let's just paste this in. And now let's just let GPT do his thing. So I'll read these after it's done writing because it's coming in pretty fast and I can't really keep up. It usually comes up with like three to five, uh, app ideas. I usually just kind of like pick the one that I want to kind of like pursue. Uh, a lot of this is kind of just play as well. Like it's supposed to be explorative. Uh, a lot of the discourse that I've been seeing on like Hacker News from quarterbacks, commenter quarterbacks from Hacker News and Twitter is that they've been like, oh, I've stumped GPT because it's a stochastic parrot uh, and it's, you know, just repeating tokens or whatever. And I find that argument to be really uncompelling. Uh, a, because so what, right? Like, what does that, what does that actually prevent in terms of what you just saw of making really good ideas that people can work off of and be creative from. And it just seems very kind of defensive as if these people are trying to say like, Oh, well, if it's not perfect, then I don't want it. You know what I mean? It's just, it's kind of lazy in my opinion, but then also, and I guess more importantly, this technology is evolving so quickly. And even though that this is the current state of the art in machine learning, who knows what this is going to inspire next. And I think part of the fun of exploring the space is using our, time and energy to come up with like really interesting prompts, come up with really interesting system commands, play with different uh, values for our um, stochastic randomness, right? Even if it is a quote unquote stochastic parrot to come up with really cool things that will make the world uh, a better place. So let's see. So the first thing that we have here is a causal model comparison, an app that allows two users to input their causal models and compare them side by side, highlighting areas of agreement and disagreement. So this is interesting because it's basically saying like, okay, okay. Yeah. Right. So maybe I should, I should probably read the quote first. <laughs> so writing app ideas for the following two people who share the same causal model will also same share all counterfactual judgments. This is from the book of why, um, and it's by Judea Pearl and it's about causality as it pertains to machine learning, actually, as well as kind of how humans make decisions. It really comes after, um, the way that statistics has kind of been done for the past century in terms of, uh, you know, correlation equals one and correlation is not equal to causation. And a lot of science trying to brush causation under the rug, Judea Pearl comes after that idea and says, no, we do need causation because, you know, when you have x equals y, for example, what did my mouse just say? Okay. When you have 2x equals y, that's equal to uh, x equals 2 divided by, or wait, y, y divided by 2, right? But there's also causality where you have x causes y, right? And you can't, that's not that's not an equal sign. You can't, you can't, let's say that two X causes Y, right? You can't move the two to this side. So there's no point in kind of, um, this, this is basically the, you know, he, he talks about path diagrams and kind of, that's the whole kind of premise of the book. So anyway, so two people who share the same causal model will also share all counterfactual judgments. And basically what this is saying is that like, if you've driven the same causal conclusion of saying, um, the firing squad has killed the prisoner and the prisoner is dead. So if the prisoner is dead, someone must have, the firing squad must have shot their rifles, right? So you must have a counterfactual argument where you would say, okay, how would the prisoner die if they didn't fire their rifles, right? 
Um, and this is, that's what like a counterfactual is. It was like, what would happen if the prison ran away? What would happen if that, if both of them didn't fire, what would happen if the captain never ordered, uh, the, the firing squad to actually shoot the rifles? So let's see what GPT came up with. Causal model comparison, an app that allows two users to input their causal models and compare them side by side, highlighting areas of agreement and disagreement. This is cool because it reminds me of kind of like, uh, a git diff. Uh, sometimes I like to like leave notes for myself next to these things. And then the nice part about chat GPT MD is that you can just remove these afterwards, right? Like you, you can basically change history, um, because all of these get parsed and sent as messages, counterfactual quiz, a quiz style app that presents a series of counterfactual scenarios and asks the user to make judgments about what would have happened in each scenario based on a causal model of another user. Um, so that one's kind of interesting because it's basically like the prisoner's dilemma a little bit. It's like kind of like game theory. It's like, okay, so you think that this caused this and they think that this caused this. What do you think they think that caused this, right? Very theory of mind, like, um, collaborative causal model building an app that facilitates collaborative building of a sh shared causal model between two users, allowing them to add nodes, edges, and weights together in real time. So this is kind of again, like I was saying, this causal model uh, builder. And I think that this would actually be kind of cool with like a mermaid JS thing. So like a, a, a collaborated mermaid JS causal model visualization tool and interactive visualization for exploring the shared causal model between two users, allowing them to see how different variables are connected and how changes in one affect the variables of others. Um, this one's kind of similar to kind of just like the interactive visualization that we have with this uh, this one, this model building, I think, um, unless it's more like graph based and you kind of like get to see kind of like your graph overlaid against somebody else's graph, I guess. Um, so maybe graph diff overlay. And then the counterfactual debate platform, a platform where two users can debate hypothetical scenarios based on their shared causal model presenting arguments for why they believe certain outcomes would or wouldn't occur given certain specific conditions. So this is kind of like debate club. So usually what I do here is then I just kind of like choose my favorite one. And sometimes I actually go out and build them. Sometimes I'll just leave them as method stubs for the purposes of these videos. I'm just going to leave them as method stubs because like I was attempting while streaming yesterday to write them out actually in code. And it was like a miserable experience because it's like just the, the errors that I ran into and I was just switching context all the time. And it was just a lot. I think it's easier just to stay within the confines of Obsidian for this purpose. So which one sounds the fun, most fun to me? So get diffing, uh, causal models, uh, sounds pretty cool, but that's kind of like a subset of this one. Uh, and then the causal model building, um, so I think the one that sticks out the most to me is number four, because that one's just kind of this one, number one as well, which I was already leaning towards, um, as well as kind of a visualization. So let's say graph get diff overlay. So we can actually just leave this in here, right? Because like I said, it, we can almost change the history and pretend that the assistant wrote that. So let's say for four, what? For four, what would be a good stack to represent a graph uh, for each user and allow us to visualize the different uh, I think we should say directed graph, right? Because it's, it's a causal graph, right? Visualize the different paths and nodes the users have made. Okay, so it says D3JS, which is probably what another, you know, software engineering consultant would recommend, right? So you see how up here it says inferring title from messages. So this is another cool thing that I added uh, to ChatGPT MD. So it says app ideas for shared causal models and counter factual judgments visualization. So it changed it from the date time 
to the actual thing and it updates in the file as well. So you can see it here for easy kind of clicking. Um, okay, cool. So let's say that, let's read what it said first. For representing a directed graph for each user and visualizing the different paths and nodes, you can use D3.js, uh, which is a JavaScript library for producing dynamic interactive data visualizations in web browsers. You can represent the directive graph using JSON or an adjacency list representation. Then you can use D3 to create an SVG that represents the graph visually as nodes of circles and edges connecting them. To allow users to interact, you could add features such as zooming, specific areas of the graph, highlighting certain nodes. Uh, for storing the graphs on the back end side, you could use MongoDB. Okay, so let's say that... Uh, I would want users to be able to upload their own graphs and then do a diff comparison of two graphs in uh, combined into one, combined into one. So let's see what it came up with. For allowing users to upload their own graphs and then do a diff comparison of two graphs combined into one, you can use the following stack. Front-end React.js, a JavaScript library for building user interfaces. Back-end Node.js with Express, a server-side framework for building web applications in Node. MongoDB really likes these MongoDB Node, like these MERN apps, right? <laughs> um, or MySQL. Actually, this time I did recommend MySQL. Um, and this is tried and true technology. I think another thing is that like Codex, uh, which is the original code model from OpenAI, was mainly trained on JavaScript and Python. So if you have to have it write code, uh, you're going to find the most luck with JavaScript and Python. And that's also partially because most of the discourse on the internet, coding language-wise, at least, is about uh, Python or, or, or Node, right? Or JavaScript. Uh, D3 again to visualize the graph. A graph diffing library. So this is cool. It actually came up with some graph diffing libraries. JS diff or deep diff to compare two JSON objects representing different versions of a graph and highlight differences between them. So, and I was actually giving us step by step how it could work. So users upload their own directed graph in JSON format through a form on the front end. The uploaded graph is sent to the back end. And this I would have like, uh, built visually too. So like they would use something like a canvas and actually create something where you'd be like, Oh, here's like a, a you know, uh, this, the, let's go with the firing squad example again. Right. So you would have the firing squad and then you'd have the, um, uh, dead prisoner. And then you'd have the, um, captain, I guess you wouldn't have the dead prisoner yet. You just have the prisoner who can be A or B, I mean, or here, not given, uh, where uh, A, B is dead or alive, which I guess would be like A and not A because those two things are exclusive, but you get my point. Anyway, so like you could say that like, oh, this goes into here and then this one goes into here and then we have our uh, the prisoner state which is caused by the captain giving the order. So the captain gives order and then the firing squad fires a rifle. And then we have the prisoner where a B is, you know, dead or alive, like we just said. Um, so, oh my gosh. The resulting object is used by D3 to create an SVG element that represents the... Oh, so this is interesting because yeah, they, we're just comparing them as JSON objects first. And then we use D3 to represent the graph visually um, with edges and lines connecting them, highlighting the nodes and edges, and then users can interact with it, uh, which is great, right? So it assumes that the user only has one directed graph at a time. If you have multiple, you'll need... Uh, which version of the graph that they want to compare and stuff like that too. So let's say, great. Can you stub out the front end um, method names 
only and one line JS docs. Actually, let's just instead of the front end, because I feel like the front end is actually less interesting than the D3. Uh, I, this is kind of like middleware, the D3 side. Can you switch out the D3 uh, JSON if workflow? So now we're just letting it do its thing, write some code. Like I said, again, I, I usually prefer to have it not write as much code um, because it, it takes up a lot of tokens. So here we go to JS and we can see what it comes up with. So we say for version one, we have await fetch API graphs version one then we're getting the JSON and then the version two, which just comes from the other user. And I think that the way that I would see this in my head is that it would be something like that uh, canvas that we just drew here, where it's like, okay, what do you think caused what, right? Do you think that the captain was the direct cause of the prisoner dying? Or do you think it was the captain who caused the firing squad who caused the death of the prisoner, right? Um, and it would just be interesting to kind of like see if, like, if I did this graph here and then another user uh, has like a different opinion on kind of like he thinks that the giving of the order is actually what what is the proximal cause for this and then might have like a firing squad like question mark right because it's like what would happens if like one member of the firing squad decides not to shoot so then we have version two and then we get this deep diff from this js deep diff library and then it, we create a new svg and then from here we select all of the nodes um, append them to the svg element based on the version of the graph <laughs> set each circle attribute uh, as radius fill color etc and this is interesting right because now it's like this is where i like this is just the method stuff thing because like you get to decide all these things right add edges as lines uh, and then append the lines to the, to the graph and then highlight the changes by covering the nodes. Okay, so that's cool. So I like that. And then let's say we want to also um, say, okay, can you stub out the front end as well? Can you stub the front end as well in the same method? And the reason I'm choosing the front end instead of the back end first is because the front end would be something that uh, would actually be the thing that users see. Like they could just upload a file of the JSON. You don't really necessarily need to do the MongoDB aspect, right? Unless you're wanting to store these graphs. So let's see. <laughs> Let it cook. <laughs> It's really going, huh? Okay, let's see what it came up with. Here's the stubbed out D3 JSON, JSON diff that works with the front end and back end methods. So I think that this is actually, do we have get graph versions here? No, we don't. So we just have this differences object. So get graph versions gets the things, the graphs, this is going to be in our front end, which React 13 just added a weight, I think, React 13, I don't know. Um, so you should be able to do this. Um, and then API graph versions get the version of our graph. Uh, and then we're going to compare version one to version two by doing a deep diff. And then it says front end method to create an SVG element that represents both versions of the graph visually create an SVG element with the appropriate dimensions, add the nodes of circles, which we all just saw before, highlight any changes. This will all be just rendered to a canvas, probably. So it's just like HTML would just be a canvas. Front-end code that calls the sequence uh, for the graphs in comparison. Uh, I'm interested to see where the, this logic here, because it says, okay, so version one, we're getting the graph versions, and then we're comparing the graph versions, and then we're creating the graph visualization, which all of these, again, are the stubs. But the really great part about this, like I said, is that you can take this directly and watch this. This part's gonna be crazy. 
so we can see here the actual uh like a code file right we just hit control v and because i have copilot installed in the bottom here i can actually just hit enter and then watch let copilot do its thing or maybe let's just say like const to get it started and then it says oh here's our created svg element and then let's do this here and maybe again i usually start it off with like const nodes elements look at that just tabbing our way through easy as that and usually these wouldn't all be variables like again you, you should expect there should be errors and stuff like that but the idea is that it's just really interesting how easy it is to, to write code these days it's literally just me hitting tab over and over this is becoming tab simulator <laughs> uh so this one's interesting because it says highlight any changes so let's see let's send it let's just say const again look at that it's using maps and filters and stuff like that it's setting the radius i'm not actually going to run this right i'm just doing this as a an example of kind of like how i code these days but i i do do this right when i'm making these apps and stuff like that and maybe if any of these apps really sticks out to me i might build one on stream you know um so yeah so we have our svg element we have our node elements that goes ahead and gets the, the create element namespace and sets all these attributes and does all these things that we we like need it to do and it's all accurate for the most part and everything like that uh and because these are just saved as uh const functions we can um refer to them. So let's say that we want to, uh, look at that. So good. And then let's say that we want to do, so yeah, then we, it's like, it's like this method is complete. You know, <laughs> it's nice because it knows when a method is kind of done too. So look at that. That took us like what, three minutes to do this and not even, it was mainly just hitting the tab key over and over. So yeah, this, this technology is insane, man crazy um so that's how i would take this this stub here so i think that's actually good for this one let's kind of leave that where it is uh one thing that i do like to do is usually have it like come up with like titles and stuff like that because i sometimes put these on my blog um but yeah this this answers most of my questions i can kind of see how d3 would be done how we might compare versions through json uh, and this gives me a good starting point that if I were going to pursue this kind of like graph app, I could see how to do all these like adjacency lists and, and kind of like things that are like kind of technical and I would need to go and find by myself.